grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our reflection this morning is based on the gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. Well, it's a holiday weekend, and uh, I'm sure most of you have plans for ways to relax and celebrate the Independence Day holiday. Maybe you have a three-day weekend off of work, and you've got a picnic, and you're going to a baseball game, or you're going to cook out, or just sit around with family and drink iced tea. I'm sure you've got some way to recharge this weekend, and I commend you to that. I remember going to school learning various tall tales. I always loved Paul Bunyan and his uh, blue ox, Babe. But there was a tall tale, do you remember the story of John Henry? In West Virginia, there's a town where there is a statue of John Henry in a plaque. Back in the late 1800s, when the railroads were being built across this nation of ours, John Henry was born a slave, a black man. But after the Civil War, he got a job laying rails for the railroad. Legend has it that he was the strongest man that ever lived. He was supposed to have weighed over 300 pounds when he was born, they say. I think that's probably, what do you call that, uh, hyperbole, maybe? Uh, now, there were several versions of his story, but they all agree on this one thing, and that is that no one could swing a hammer or hit harder than John Henry could. Now, according to one version of the story, the crew was pounding its way through a granite mountain, making a tunnel for the train so that it could go through the mountain instead of around it. And it was cruelly difficult and dangerous work. A thousand men died in one summer because of rock slides and errant uh, dynamite explosions. The owner of the railroad one time appeared before the work crew with a large steam-powered drill that he said could do the work of a hundred men. Old John Henry took offense and boasted that no machine could outwork him. So they made a wager right then and there to see who could drill the fastest by midday. John Henry or the steam-powered drill. Now John Henry lifted two 20-pound sledgehammers, one in each hand, and the contest began. The steam drill uh, belched out clouds of scalding mist and screamed like a dragon. The spectators were showered with dust and debris. And by the time the sun was straight overhead, the contest was halted and the air was cleared and measurements were taken. And six hours straight, John Henry had burrowed nine feet into the hillside. The steam drill had burrowed seven feet. So the workers cheered and a deafening roar went up and they gathered around their hero. But no sooner had poor John Henry been declared the victor and champion than he collapsed dead on the spot. In the 19th century when steam power was just developing and the railroads were being built, there was the concern that men would be replaced with machines at certain jobs. The story of John Henry became the legend of the working man. He became a folk hero. John Henryism is the belief that is so popular in our time, in our culture, that you can do anything you set your mind to so long as you work hard enough at it. The belief that with enough effort and sweat and determination, you can hammer your way through a mountain. Some, uh, there's some merit to that, of course, but uh, it does have its costs. I was reading a study, there have been all sorts of different uh, uh, vocational studies and some people think that Americans as a society compared to other countries work too hard. According to one research study, we spend more time on average at our cubicles or offices or places of employment than really people from almost any other industrialized nation in the world with only one or two exceptions. Did you know that? American workers also have less vacation time than most nations and if that weren't enough, we are prone to not use all the vacation time that is allotted. And those that do take time off frequently end up checking in with the office by cell phone or email from the beach. Guilty as charged. 
Not to mention the growing tendency people have of bringing work home. There was a time when farmers worked from sunrise to sundown, but now it's possible with electric lights mounted on their tractors to work long past nightfall. Hard work, industry, is one of our core values as a nation, and certainly that's consistent with our Christian outlook, but it is possible to have too much of a good thing. Work is good, it, it, but it is God who instilled within us the need to rest. Resting is a blessed thing. Our bodies require a certain amount of sleep in order to function optimally. I read something just this last week that said that um, Americans today average two hours less sleep than we did 50 years ago. Isn't that interesting? That we average two hours a night less sleep than our grandparents did, or maybe even just our parents. Many of you will have a three-day weekend this week, and I want to say to you it is important to take these special occasions, these holidays, these gifts of the calendar, and I want you to use them as opportunities to recharge your batteries. And I know people rest and uh, get recharged and relax in different ways. What gives you uh, a sense of renewal may be different than what gives me that same renewal. For some of us, it's outdoor games or sports and activities. For others, it just means a soft chair and a good book. And all of that, all of it, is fine and good. It is blessed. It is part of God's created order of things. In fact, I want you to note that to intentionally and purposefully avoid proper rest is a sin against God because you are essentially telling Him that He designed you badly and you should be able to go without stopping, without resting. Are you the gerbil in the wheel that just keeps going round and round? Yes, work is virtuous. God works and we work. And on the other side, sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. But work can become for us an, an, a false god. It can become, we can become idolatrous when we put our faith and build our whole lives around our labors, our efforts, instead of the generosity of God the Creator. Now we could probably debate the various benefits or drawbacks of America's changing work habits, but one thing is clear, many of us have busy, hectic lives, and it's exhausting. One study said that two-thirds of Americans say that they often feel stressed. Almost half of Americans claim they feel pressured to succeed, and just about that same percentage says that they often feel overwhelmed. I'll say that again, about half of our people in this country say that they often feel overwhelmed. And that's what I want to focus on because I think that feeling of being overwhelmed has a spiritual dimension to it, a spiritual component. And Jesus, our Lord, said today, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. You know, I, I, it just comes to me, this last week I visited one of our shut-in members, uh, a, a dear lady in her, in her mid-90s. And uh, usually whenever I go and visit shut-ins, I, um, when I take communion to them, the, the gospel reading or the Bible reading that I read to them is usually gonna, is the Bible reading for the coming Sunday, so it helps me throughout the week begin to think about it and prepare for it. So I read this passage. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I read that whole passage uh, to this, this dear lady. Like I said, she's in her 90s. She lives with a caretaker and um, hardly ever gets out. She, her, her mind is still very sharp. Um, and after we had communion, <laughs> as she always does, uh, she offered me uh, some brandy or uh, <laughs> sherry. And of course, I said, certainly. And, um, and, we, and we, had, <laughs> we talked and we, we had conversation. She said, Pastor, where was that Bible reading from again? And um, so I, 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 she got her Bible out and I showed her where it was from. And she, that verse, Get, come to me you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. She said, oh, I, I really like that, she said. I was thinking about that later and I was thinking, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> 
because on, on, to, to a certain viewer, it would appear that all she does is rest. She doesn't produce anything. She doesn't go to work anymore. She doesn't, her family is raised. It, you almost, you know, on a certain level you're asking, what is it that wears her out? She's not working. But life for her, like it does for everybody, no matter what your station, has burdens. And this comforted, this verse comforted, comforted her. I often remind people that God commands us to rest. And the gospel gives us the example of Jesus himself who would sometimes separate from the crowds in order to be alone and to pray and to rest. The very first uh, part of our Bible, the creation account in the book of Genesis, tells us that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. But what does that exactly mean, that God rested? I don't think it means that God slept in a couple of hours and went fishing or became a couch potato and channel surfed all afternoon. No, the scripture says that God had completed his creation and he looked out upon it and beheld that it was very good and he rested. For God, rest does not, simp does not imply that he was tired, that he was worn out from all that heavy labor of creating mountains and oceans and such. It simply means that for six days he produced things and on the seventh day, what did he do? He enjoyed the fruit of his labor. The pressure that many of us feel, no matter what your station in life, is the pressure to be productive at all times. We feel pressured to produce a satisfying income so that we can offer a certain standard of living for our families or we feel pressured to provide our children with all the opportunities and experiences which we think they'll need to have a happy life. At work, maybe you feel pressured to impress your boss to get that a promotion or raise. And in our relationships, we feel pressured to live up to whatever expectations are placed upon us. We feel the need to be productive and to be useful in order to have value or worth. And so ultimately, when God commands us to rest, he is telling us that we must set aside time each week to do nothing, to produce nothing, to accomplish nothing or achieve nothing, but simply to enjoy and be thankful for the fruits of our labors and the benevolence of God. That's one, that's one reason, frankly, why we come to church on our, our Christian day of rest. Worship is like that. You know, when we come here into God's house, uh, we produce nothing. There's no uh, measurable fruit uh, of our work in this place. To a non-believer, worship is seen as wasted time. But for us, it is holy time because whenever we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forced to take the focus off of ourselves and what we do and can do or should be doing and instead put our focus on what God has done in His creation and redemption through Jesus Christ, what He continually is doing for us even now. The way that you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the third commandment says, is to set aside time in your life to hear God's word, to receive from Him His mercy and love, to receive the sacrament. And remember that your sins have been paid for in full by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And you've been washed clean in His sight. And when God looks out upon you, He sees saints. There's more to the rest that Jesus offers than...